talk about uh, Micro Linux uh, init, uh, and I remember System 5 init, so we will see how this is different. Uh, this is Sven, uh, who's thankfully said I don't have to pronounce his last name. Thank welcome, Sven. So the title of this talk until yesterday was something to do with Rancher OS and Golang because I used to work on Rancher OS. I've been incredibly fortunate in my career. I started off being a commercial C++ dev like an awful lot of people and got involved in the wiki revolution. Um, looking around, most of you probably have used a wiki now. Um, and then somewhere along the lines, Docker came along and I started working on boot to Docker, which got me picked up as working for Docker for a few years. Um, and then when that stopped, I kind of started, I did a year working on Rancher OS, where I continued playing with micro Linux distros uh, for containers. Um, and once we released that, I've kind of uh, petered off and now I'm working at Syro. Um, so that's who I am, um, and part of the fortunate thing about this, uh, about my career has been that I've been able to follow a series of curiosities because of open source. Um, and I hope that other people get this opportunity as well. Um, so now, about you guys, as rather a lot of you, um, who here has used Docker? Okay, no, no. Who, who here hasn't used Docker? Excellent. Be nice to know why. Um, but yes. Uh, who here has played with Go in some way? Uh, again, again, who here hasn't played with Go because, yeah, it's, it's a different group, but similar sort of size. And uh, for those of you who haven't played with Docker, have you played with containers instead, like LXD or cool? Um, so it, it's, to, to me, one of the, the most fascinating things in joining the, the, the Docker thing was that uh, I came from spending the last 10, 15 years writing Perl code and JavaScript, and I just found Go incredibly easy to uh, read and make changes in. Um, so much so that some people have started rewriting their bash scripts in Go, um, which makes me wonder why we don't have people writing their build systems in Go source. So, and then, yeah, it's kind of a bit. Um, OK, so this talk is kind of about container inspired micro Linux. And I mean, the reason I got into boot to Docker was because I was prior to that mucking around with, with FossWiki and Twiki, and I made installers for Windows and uh, OS X, despite being a Linux user on my desktop. Um, and it seemed to me that as I was writing documentation from what I was learning about Docker, um, that the biggest issue people were facing was that they couldn't actually use Docker on their system. Because how many people actually run Linux? In fact, how many people here don't run Linux on their desktop or notebook? And I have now joined you again. Um, in my current job, I get given a Windows box. It's fascinating. Um, but you know, the world has moved on. Now we get Docker for Windows. We don't have to use Win Unix services for Windows anymore. We get Ubuntu for Windows. Um, for those of you who use Windows, how much fun is it having four different shells that don't talk to each other and don't work together? <laughs> I, I, it, it, it astounds me how often I'm sitting there in one of my sh shells going, run this command, oh no, that's installed over there. And they, yeah. Um, but anyway, so container inspired, I mean, micro Linux is for me started out of trying to help others be able to read and play with the documentation I was writing. And so I started working on boot to Docker, which was created by a, a friend of Solomon's. Um, but in playing with a micro Linux distro, you realize that it's actually interesting to be able to boot quickly. And obviously, AWS and Azure are now charging per second. Um, I get the feeling that everybody cares about boot times being as small as possible. Um, they're also simpler for users to reason about, or at least so I thought until I started writing this talk, at which point I'm looking at the inits of both boot to Docker and uh, Rancher OS and Linux kit and going, yeah, they need to be simpler. And 
The other weird thing that I like to play with is the idea of actually being immutable. And so I like to boot my hardware or virtual machine with stuff which doesn't get to change. If I want to change it, then I boot a new one. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of other reasons why people like to think about uh, micro Linuxes. Oh, yeah. And if anybody has any ideas, shout them out. I will repeat them. Um, I, I kind of like to have the feedback of knowing what you're thinking. Um, OK, so where I started, boot to Docker and Docker Toolbox. Um, I just thought a little bit of history where uh, Steve Marin made a, a, a micro Linux out of TinyCore. Now, TinyCore is already microscopic. These days, it's like 15 meg as an ISO. Um, back then, it used to be, I think, 42 or something. It used to be a little bit bigger. Um, and then adding Docker to it pretty much blows out the same size to where it started. Um, and then we started wrapping it in a set of tools so that you can go boot to Docker start, and it would create your virtual machine on your box, whether that was VirtualBox, later QMU, and so on. Um, and so therefore, we, you know, I, I wrapped that in a, a set of installers and so on, and that eventually became Docker machine and Docker toolbox. Um, how many of you here have played with boot to Docker before toolbox existed? So the world has moved on. Uh, I gave a talk about boot to Docker probably in Auckland, and a huge proportion of people had played with boot to Docker at the time. Um, so it's nice to see the audience has changed. Um, and then Docker toolbox. Anybody have to play with that? Wow. Beautiful Linux audience. Um, I was going to show some of Boot to Docker's init code, but it is just init, as in busy boxes init, and a whole pile of shell scripts, and that's not very go-ish, so we get to move on. OK, Rancher OS, on the other hand, was an experiment made by Darren and his guys at Rancher, um, where they basically took the idea of a micro distro and said, what happens if everything is a container? So there's a container for DHCP, there's a container for NTP, there's a container for UDEV, and a container for, I've forgotten. Um, but even more fun, there's a container image for a user Docker. And so that means that what the user interacts with is actually a containerized thing on top of your micro Linux. And that gives you fun little things like being able to change what version of Docker you're running, uh, and that sort of thing. So we start with that. And this was after Fig got acquired, so it was part of the Docker Compose idea. So they took Cloud Init and added to that the idea that you can use Docker Compose constructs to orchestrate what is running in your operating system. Um, and to me, this, is, this was the idea that we would have liked to have done for Boot to Docker, but really there were better things or different things afoot uh, in the Docker company. Um, you know, Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows and Linux kit, which I'll kind of push into next. Um, so that was the idea. OK, um, how are we doing? Oh, that's 10. Cool. Now, this is the pain. So, oh, and because of that, I, of course, managed to forget. to start my machine. Um, this is one of the fun things where I'm running a QMU virtual machine started by and created by Docker Machine. Um, at home, I would normally shuffle this off to my VMware server. Um, and other people use it for AWS and so on. Yeah. So here's me showing you how I would create a virtual machine using Docker machine. Um, the fun things are, let's see, did we get there? Yes. OK, so there's our Docker that the user interacts with. OK, maybe that's a bit big. Can you guys all see? Whoops. <laughs> that wasn't quite what I meant. All right. Are we better off? Is that still visible? Yeah. Yeah. OK, sweet. All right, so we've got the Docker, the user Docker running. And we also have um, 
I'm going to rue the day. OK, and this is all of the C system services that we're running to keep Rancher OS up and going. Um, and as you can see, there's not very many of them. One of the, actually, I might just start the boot to Docker one as well. So much easier with i3. I was gutless. OK. Um, but that said, we're still running quite a few things. Um, kind of scary. And if we have boot to Docker running yet, no, we don't. All right, so the fun things that I liked about this. Can I spell? Nope. is right now I could switch between any of those Docker engines. Um, and I can also switch between consoles. Uh, yeah, and there's the downside of Homebrew. Um, and so the shell that you interact with, which is running in a container, can be switched to whatever you're most familiar with and then you can go off and build your stuff, uh, create more compose files, and use not only this as a development platform, but also as your deployment uh, system, which I quite like. Um, meanwhile, over here, uh, reason I kind of wanted to show this is boot to Docker being cut down is actually Slightly smaller. Shh. Not nice. <laughs> um, but can I remember how to do this? That there should show. Oh, there we go. It's only a page worth. That's all the non kernel things that are running uh, in Boot to Docker. And I'm not sure that I can do that right now in this kernel. But we'll try. There we go. It's very similar. Um, Got all the AGD stuff. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and we're setting up terminals manually, which is the pits. Uh, not much fun. OK, so well. There we go. I could switch consoles, but I don't really want to use up the Wi-Fi um, because this is running locally. Um, so one of the things that uh, attracted me to, to the way Rancher OS did things is this is the cloud config, for example, that I'm using or was using to play with uh, PyHole, um, which is a, a malware kind of avoidance DNS server. Um, and really, I was running machine create on my VMware server, uh, Rancher OS with this config, and bam, there it was running. Now, those of you who are ops-minded, unlike me, uh, would realize the fatal flaw. Uh, it might not be quite obvious until I scroll down. Um, this ran beautifully for about three months, and then died because it ran out of disk space because I was not managing my logs. Um, don't do that especially when you're uh, away on a conference. <laughs> um, yes, there was many angry Slack messages. Uh, I was just playing with it, honest. Um, and this, this is one of those, to segue, reasons why I think DevOps is, is a fun idea, but I actually need an ops person to look over my shoulder and tell me that I'm an idiot. Um, and if anybody would like to be my ops person at home, that would be great. Um, so that's the Docker Compose version. Seemingly, there's this great big secret that most people don't realize is that Cloud Init also allows you shell scripts, which means that firstly, you can do something silly like this, where my shell script, if it detects that it's running on my home box, will go off and use Docker Machine to create a virtual machine running this state. And then after that, can be used to format my disks, to do an install, and to pass a new Cloud Init because the way Rancher OS works is that it actually takes the cloud and it and stores it on its disk if it gets one. 
Um, I guess one of the things I forgot to mention is that in the previous example, I'm not actually installing, I'm doing this in a very boot to dockery kind of way where the operating system just runs off the ISO and I think in that case, I gave it some disk but I didn't need to. Um, so when I say it ran out of disk, uh, disk space, it actually ran out of memory. Tasty. Um, okay. So when I didn't know anything about Rancher OS, I was thinking it was a cooler way to do a mutable, but in actual fact, it's not a mutable. Like the operating system, which is convenient for the operating system manufacturer, who for a year was me, it is immutable, but then once the users get involved, all of their customization happens at boot time, which means we might have an operating system that is lovely and fast to boot, but it's not ready. And what you want is something that will, you know, I want one of these now, a load balancer, and it's up and serving traffic. Um, okay. So because this is Golang, I thought I'd do something really silly and show some code. Um, and luckily, uh, maybe this is, can I make this smaller? Yes, I can. All right. That's probably the most famous line of code I have ever written. Um, apparently, that is still around, what year is it? Four and a half years later. Um, and if you make a disk with boot to Docker or Rancher OS or any of the other derivatives or conceptual derivatives, I think Photon might do it as well. Uh, if it detects this as the first uh, binary parts on a, on a disk when it boots, it will format this disk. Really handy. Not exactly a clever string to use though. I didn't think it would last. Um, okay, so basically Rancher OS goes off and does a ton of things. It goes off and prepares the init RAM uh, disk. It tries to find enough information to do networking so that it can do cloud init from a network. Uh, it goes and has a look at the, uh, what's it called, OpenStack style um, config2 CD-ROM um, and then goes off and configures your operating system. And it is, unfortunately, way worse than this looks um, because we keep finding little things and, and fixing corner cases. Um, we also have these fun little quirks where, for example, doing a shutdown halt seems to break every second or third kernel. And presumably it's our fault, but it's, it's one of those fun pains. Um, yeah, we even do SE Linux, lovely. Okay, where am I? Okay, yes, supporting distros is hard work. If you ever get the chance to make your own distro, do it, it's fun. You'll learn a stack. Uh, try not to have users. Um, uh, yes, and try really hard not to have commercial users who rely on you in production. I think that this is the, the biggest change between Boot to Docker and Rancher OS is that Boot to Docker was clearly for developers to play with and learn. Rancher OS is in use in production. And when boring, simple, you know, unimportant things like Meltdown and Spectre happen, um, yeah, little micro distros like uh, Rancher OS get to have people running around like headless chooks. Um, luckily, now that I've left, they've got more people involved. Um, I think the, the worst thing I did was say, yes, I can do this. Um, <laughs> learned a lot, it was fun, but uh, yeah, not doing that again. Um, because you need to keep up with everything. Now Rancher OS has a Linux kernel in it. It also uses build root. Even weirder, as I discovered probably about two months before I stopped uh, working on it, it has two build roots. Um, it, you know, as things grow, the, 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 the complexity gets hidden, especially with the containers where you know, the, the, the second build root was actually just coming in from a container that was up there on Docker Hub and I had not noticed. Um, and quite frankly, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think they've killed that now, but you know, it's, yes. But there are benefits, and the benefits really should be boot times. Your security footprint should be much, much smaller. One of the things I 
have trouble feeling comfortable with is the fact that our desktop operating systems and our server operating systems, for convenience reasons, are essentially identical. And that means while it's nice to be able to plug in USB and have my devices magically uh, get created and all the rest of it, I have a lot of trouble figuring out why do I want my server hardware to magically update at all? You know, maybe there's this boot window where things have to come up and be orchestrated by the kernel and UDEV and so on. But after that, why? Um, and obviously, micro Linuxes should or are slowly heading towards, we bring it all up. Once it's there, that's what's happening. And it will stay that way. Um, immutable infrastructure is, I think, kind of really handy to be able to think about a system as, this is a load balancer. And when I say that, that is all it does. It does nothing more. And yes, maybe it has a sidecar that deals with you know, offloading the logging. But what else do I want my load balancer to be doing? Um, which unfortunately or fortunately means I'm conceptually heading towards unikernels. Um, who here likes the idea of unikernels? Why? <laughs> Does anybody have a lib answer for why, other than what I've just? For the right single application, where all you want that one machine to do is run one, run, run one application. Yeah. It does make sense. See Van Jacobson's talk uh, at LCA 2006. If you hand the networking out of the kernel into the application, there's a whole bunch of True, yes, yes. And mind you, they've, of course, improved that in the kernel where now handing data between user space and kernel space is, is optimized. But nonetheless, do I need a generic operating system in my router switch or whatever? Yeah. And, and I mean, yes, I like OpenWRT. So, you know, you've got that dichotomy of it is easy to play with something that's not a unikernel. But if we're deploying systems, do we want to be able to play with it? Or do we want to know that that is running what we, are, what we expect it to be running? Um, and so to me, it just becomes easier to, uh, to reason about. So one of the things that came out of Docker doing the succession from Docker Toolbox boot to Docker and so on is that they started working on Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows. And they built their own micro Linux distribution building thing. Um, and they went the whole hog and just said, OK, there's no mucking around. All we do is create a file system out of containers, and then we run them in containers, which sounds ideal um, until. So I have a whole pile of tabs here. Wonderful. Where did they go? Does anybody know how to actually drive this magic? Oh, here they are. I can't see them. Sorry. Yeah, no, you're right. I'm just colorblind now. OK, here we go. This is how to define a Linux kit uh, micro Linux distro. This one is intended to run Docker. Um, but at the moment, there's something broken on my system, I think. And so it goes through, figures out I want to use this kernel. And I'm going to have an init set of processes uh, on my hard. So the init RD is initially created out of that init section. And then we've got a series of on boot and services containers that get run using run C in the, in the on boot section, or used to be, and then services which get run using container D. And at the end, you should end up with a terminal that you can run Docker run at. Um, I don't find this particularly readable, but <laughs> it is very specific and tells you exactly which images it's going to run. Um, and you can link them up. So uh, that's what you would be interacting with. Uh, and as an example of their init, um, a little more painful because they go off and try to do a trick to allow Docker to uh, pivot root. And so the first init calls another init, um, which then basically just goes off and calls this. Um, no, I've lost my marbles. <laughs> 
So in, in, in many ways, I think what I was trying to say with this is that uh, Linux Kit being an evolution of all of these ideas, its init process is simpler to understand again than Rancher OS was, and I think easier to understand than the scripted way. And I can't say much about System D because I don't, I've, I've spent so much time not looking at System D. But when I do have to play with a System D system, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, well, I assume that people who know what they're doing uh, with it can figure out what order things are running in uh, by looking at the config and can debug that. And I just kind of, you know, I, I, I haven't tried enough, so I, I can't make a judgment on that. Um, you know, people say they don't like system D, I kind of don't like this, even though it does what it does remarkably well. Um, okay. And then once you run uh, Docker in QMU, you can, as in this image, you can then go off and run Docker inside this virtual machine. Um, I won't do it again because I really don't want to uh, spend a few seconds, minutes. All right, where am I? Can you tell I got lost? All right. All right. The downside with Linux Kit is that you saw from the YAML file you need to not only keep up with everything, so you know, need to know when there's vulnerability in Linux, uh, you need to know when there's a vulnerability in any of those containers. Um, and you need to be able to figure out how to take those GUIDs or whatever they are and figure out what you're actually running. Um, so you need to be more and more aware of what's going on. And I, I, I suppose that's actually just made more obvious by a micro Linux distro because we're putting it in your face and saying you need to choose when to upgrade. Whereas if you're running Ubuntu on your server, you're sort of outsourcing those decisions and waiting until Ubuntu has a fix and just installing it. In reality, we all probably should be keeping ourselves aware of all of those vulnerabilities anyway uh, so we know when to switch our computer off uh, and wait for a fix at the same time. Um, so it's, it, it's hard, it's really easy to poke holes in these, these um, Linuxes because they make some of the problems that we have front and center and really obvious because now you're in charge of putting these things together. And I think that's also one of the things that uh, Juju or you know, th those CD building tools can be doing if you're using them, uh, but most of us avoid it. We just install Debian as I have on this box and try to remind ourselves to app get update regularly enough. Um, okay, I think I covered that. Um, but essentially, because of the way that Docker was split up, uh, we can bootstrap our operating systems. And I ended up doing uh, Rancher OS demo version using a Linux kit and rewriting its init to do the same sort of thing as Linux kit. Um, and the nice thing that came out of that was, let's see, am I able to show this? It was a lovely ancient tool called Boot Chart that goes through and shows how long it took what parts of your boot process to run. Now this is probably something we should all be doing more of um, because as I was getting to this one, and this is the last iteration I did before I gave the talk, um, there's a whole stack of things that all of our operating systems, including the one I was working on, are doing that you probably don't need. Um, and with Ubuntu, you're probably going to find the same thing. And there was a talk at uh, LinuxConf um, in Prague uh, about embedded things where uh, the guy giving the talk, whose name escapes me, um, showed that there were three seconds of his embedded Linux OS spent waiting for ButterFS to decide there was no RAID on the system. Um, and I'm sure that in some of the kernels I've built, I've been built, guilty of building in ButterFS as well. Um, I, I assume that there are ways to configure ButterFS so it doesn't do that, but his, of course, you know, embedded situation, he was just going, why do I have ButterFS? Remove it. And suddenly his boot times went down to somewhere under a second, I think. Um, and where under a second, you know, the, the, the idea of, of measuring this is 
that you want to go from turn it on to it's doing what you need it to be doing in as little time as possible. You know, the, the, the time to get to init is part of that. Um, and so I think in this example, uh, container D and whatever it was that I was running, it might have been a shell or so, is ready before that last uptick. So it, it was somewhere around the eight, nine second mark, um, which is kind of awful, but a heck of a lot better than the 40 or so seconds that I think it was when I started because Linux Kit and Rancher OS do things differently from each other. Um, okay. Clearly, never do that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right, now, as so many of you uh, put your hand up as being, uh, I have tried Go, um, we go even more extreme. There is now a really small little tool that some, uh, I think they're mostly Google developers, uh, have created so that you can create your own initramfs uh, directly from Go source code. And so what this example is doing is it's taking the uroot commands and they've rewritten a whole stack of the Unix toolkit uh, in Go or simplified versions and it adds a, a shell that is slightly nicer than the, uh, the built-in shell and it goes off and builds something which you can then run. Um, now, where am I? Does anybody know where I am? Here I am. Yes. Uh, okay, I'm going to let that go. It doesn't take that long, but the thing that I thought is the most remarkable is that their init process does a little bit of setting up for some of the magic I'll talk about later and then just goes through and runs a loop starting things. Where am I? So we mount some file system bits in. Um, and here we go. We're going through this list of processes to spawn. That's it. So, so it is doing the bare minimum that you need to get a Linux system up and then starting Essentially, the first two, the first one's legacy. The second one is the, a user in it so that you can add stuff yourself. And the third one is their basic shell. And that's it. And once it exits, unfortunately, the Linux kernel crashes. Um, so th this is, in many ways, the simplest little thing that you could have as an init. Um, and it doesn't take long. I always forget we're ready already. Um, and there we go. That was instant. No, no, this is really slow. If you've ever played with uh, Clear Linux, it does gets to that point even faster because what they're doing is using processor isolation things uh, in a slightly customized QMU, although that might be upstream by now. Um, and it's like, it's container fast. Uh, the only problem is you've got to trust Intel and we've had a few things in the last couple of months which have made me reevaluate that choice. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. The fun thing about. Uh, no, this is, this is, this is the downside of uh, Go. Apparently, they have their own flag parsing library, and despite the fact that we've hated it for a long time, it's still the way it is because plan nine. Um, that's probably the thing I detest the most about uh, Go. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And now back to this talk. All right. I, yep, shown that. Um, I'll put it in Docker. 
Okay. No, I, I think I'll just skip this and say this is how you would run up a container. Um, doing the same thing with you, but root would be make build. Oh. Am I in the right place? No, I am not. I'm in the wrong place. How did I get there? Who did this to me? No. Okay. Whoever organized my no, my uh, computer, they're fired. Uh, me. Okay. Make build Alpine. Okay. So this is a very Dockery kind of thing. Um, see how clever I got. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm getting the Alpine container and exporting its file system into the uh, rootfs directory, whacking that into a CPIO, which uroot will then use as a base. So I'm going to get a uroot made in it rd um, file system that in this case probably doesn't contain quite enough pieces of uroot, so I won't be able to get network, I think. Um, but we'll see. Hello? All right. It's kind of big. I'm sorry. Uh -oh. Uh, oh. uh, was that enough? Yes, it was. So what I essentially have is, all right, it is actually fetching. So there we go. Um, so if you look at that list, again, it is mostly Nothing. Um, grip minus V. Where are we? That's it. That's all I'm running. Um, and it acts like an Alpine. It's just I've got none of the things uh, running, which means I don't have Dbus. Um, and so on, for better or worse. OK, can I remember how to shut this down? Yay. Cool. All right. And that's pretty much how I created that guy. And um, yes, it is clear containers. Clear containers, you can go docker run uh, with whatever the parameter is to select the, uh, the, the run C equivalent in clear containers. And it will go off and do exactly this kind of thing. But then it'll also mount in file systems when you do bind mounts and all sorts of clever things to work just like Docker. It's just a virtual machine. Um, all right. So as you saw, I can't remember how uroot is implemented shutdown. I can't remember the flags. So that was the first thing I thought I'd go off and add to my uinit. So I've made a user init that just goes through and runs date DHCP client, starts a shell, and when the shell exits, runs shutdown. Um, kind of a lot more like the way that um, a Docker container works. Yeah, well done. <laughs> All right, so, and that should be, let's do this in Debian. I'm sure this will work every time. Um, so here, I've made my uh, CPIO, um, and then I'm building in the DH uh, client that comes with uroot, adding Elvish and my <coughs> uh, init. And that's built. So now I should go make run. Um, unfortunately, unpacking takes longer. That's life. OK, so we now have an IP address. And I have a shell. And if I control D from this, things don't quite work. <laughs> have to do an exit. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's just cruel. Very cruel. Cool. 
you typed exit, it would have worked. Yes, 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 that's right. I, yeah. Oh, I just killed my own example. Hurrah. <laughs> okay. When, when was that compiled? From just the, then. That was in the compiler. Yes. Yeah. No, 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 no. So, so the, the, this compilation was when I type make build okay. Debian, it invokes uroot, which invokes the Go compiler and does the whole thing. Um, I, I was going to do this with containers, but things go and fall over. Right. Okay. Um, before I get to that, another feature that I haven't talked about with uroot because I didn't get it working in time for the talk is that they also have a source code mode where they build this init RD with the Go toolchain in it and the source code to all of their commands and whatever else you link in. And then when you execute those things, it will build them and obviously store them so that next time you execute them, they're even faster, which I'm not sure what they're using it for, but I'm kind of thinking instead of having my cloud init in shell, um, I can now have my cloud init in Go. In fact, that U init uh, that I showed you before could actually be my cloud init. Um, again, we're not immutable, so you know, there are obviously two different use cases. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's a cool example of how simple and quick and easy things are now. Um, creating this sort of thing 10 years ago was fun. Um, you know, a lot of us played with uh, Linux from scratch um, and you learned a lot, but it's something that very few people did. Whereas with something like Uroot and possibly Linux Kit, you can take your small, single application and run it. So one of the things I'm gonna do is, as I said, make a load balancer container with a log uh, distribution beastie in it, and that is all it will run. And then I've gotta figure out how to get Kubernetes to not hate me. Um, okay, I'm gonna segue a little bit. Docker machine, who here has used or does use Docker machine? Very few, wow, the way the world changes, cool. Um, Docker Machine has stagnated a bit in the recent years and I was kind of thinking, if people are interested in Docker Machine, there are some people who are getting together and pulling in all the drivers into a GitHub organization so that we can breathe some life back into this. Um, and one of the reasons is because Minikube and some of the other Kubernetes uh, tools actually use the Docker Machine drivers. Um, and so they're still being used and we need to start giving them some love because they're not part of Docker's current um, commercial priorities. Uh, cool. Thank you. Astoundingly. I think at the moment they're cheating in that they're not using That's a boot. Question. Yep, okay, so Uroot, is Uroot combining the, the traditional bootloader like Grub and so on and the init? And the answer is no. Um, they're kind of avoiding it right now and we start QAMU by saying there's your init RD, there's your kernel, go. Could you put actual Sorry. hardware with Uroot? Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop the questions because we haven't reached Theoretically. This is, it is lunchtime, so I'm sure if anyone wants to come down and ask questions, they might be around for a few more minutes. Yep, yep definitely. <laughs>